missing if you weren't at the uh, reception last night uh, there in the front and it's really a pleasure for me to uh, be here. Uh, we did see the mountains last night. I know they're there. Uh, <clears throat> they're definitely there. So um, this is um, an interesting course because it addresses very big questions and hopefully what will happen by some sort of magic uh, during the five days here is that uh, Jim and John and myself without consciously trying to coordinate our lectures because we didn't coordinate our lectures uh, will come to some sort of synergy and synthesis uh, that will lead uh, to uh, some good insights uh, among uh, the the participants here at the school. I have no illusions that there are any big questions that will be answered, but of course what's important in a school like this is that uh, some insights arise that, uh, that will lead to uh, future work and, uh, and future discoveries. Is that me knocking on myself? So I want to move this farther away. Okay. How's that? Much better. Okay, good. See, I failed as a rock star because I couldn't <laughs> soften my P's and S's. So let me give you an introduction to what I'm going to talk about this week. And um, I've put the, uh, the announcement for my part of this course on the left-hand side here. And some comments about it will appear on the right-hand side. So I'm mostly responsible for talking about the astrophysical conditions for the development of life. But this also includes uh, worlds in our own solar system, uh, as well as extrasolar planets. And uh, we're going to start by discussing this morning interstellar matter and chemistry. Now this is an area that I suspect, when I found out who is actually attending, uh, that there are an awful lot of people in this room who know more about it than I do. So I'm going to quickly veer away from a sort of a standard discussion of the cycle of matter in the galaxy to what I regard as a more interesting discussion of the premise that the reason that we're all here is not the abundant energy that we get from the sun, but the sun's very low entropy, uh, which is a consequence of the fact that uh, energy generation occurs in self-gravitating bodies, namely stars, rather than diffused throughout the cosmos. Uh, and then. Later today, uh, I'll talk about the general ideas of star and planet formation. Uh, almost nothing about how stars form except for uh, collapse of core clumps. I want to focus on planet formation because uh, it's been clear for many years now that <coughs> giant planets play a critical role in determining in the systems in which they're present the properties of the terrestrial planets and the habitability of those terrestrial planets and the kinds of dynamical simulations that are being done uh, even just over the last couple of years, the Nice model, for example, really emphasize that more than ever. So I want to focus uh, on the giant planets. And one thing I'm going to try out on you is an argument that comes not at all from astrophysics, but comes from geophysics. And not from the geophysics of giant planets, but the geophysics of moons. Uh, an argument that um, I would assert provides us with an absolute age for Saturn. That is the time from when the first solids formed uh, in our solar system to the time that Saturn's moons uh, were essentially fully accreted. So we'll talk about that later today. And then we'll move on to uh, formation of the terrestrial planets which uh, at least in our system appears to have been uh, the second stage of really two stages of planet formation around the Sun. Uh, most important in this regard, of course, is the fact that we're here and that we have terrestrial planets. But also important is that uh, water arrived at the Earth. Is that me? It is. Okay, much better. Uh, is the fact that water arrived at the Earth. And the question is, how did the Earth get that water? Because there's something of a paradox in expecting that a planet that sits at a distance appropriate for being in its habitable zone, for being in the star's habitable zone, to actually have large amounts of liquid water. And I'll explain that. So um, I'll talk about various models, but the conclusion that I'll come to is that 
the source of Earth's water is not represented by anything that's in our meteorite collections, which is kind of unfortunate, but at the moment, that's what I'm thinking. Um, we'll move on then to the early evolution of the Earth, collisions and bombardments. Uh, the earliest history of the Earth, as was the case for the earliest history of all the planets, was really dominated by collisions, uh, the impact frequency and how that impact frequency tailed off, and the possibility that seems now almost certain that there was a peak, uh, a later peak in the distribution called the late heavy bombardment. How that actually affected the habitability of the Earth is very, very important. And um, one of the interesting questions associated with the potential origin of the late heavy bombardment uh, through uh, an outcome of the, the, the NICE model, the model that's been offered by the group led by Morbidelli, is that um, perhaps the history of the earliest, the earliest history of the Earth may be, uh, if not necessarily anomalous, at least particular. That is, there may not be a typical early history for planets that are potentially habitable when we think about one system versus another. Um, here, Jim Casting and I will begin to converge harmoniously, and uh, our lectures will magically complement each other. Uh, of course, it's Jim who has really done um, uh, with his colleagues and uh, predecessors and so on all the work on the habitable zone. Uh, I've actually tried to take a, a, a twist on the habitable zone and talk not so much about liquid water but liquid methane, and I'll explain why that is uh, when I give this lecture. And uh, if you then feel cheated that I didn't talk about the classic habitable zone, you can ask Jim to explain it for you. I'll then move on uh, in lectures six and seven to talk about the worlds in our solar system that may potentially be habitable. Uh, now, as astrophysicists, you should immediately recognize that as soon as somebody says, these are the worlds you should focus on, it might be better to go look at other worlds because almost always theorists are wrong but they're usually wrong for a good reason, and that advances science. Uh, so these are the worlds that have been most talked about in our solar system, Mars, Europa, Titan, and Enceladus, aside from the Earth, of course. Uh, Jim and I are both going to talk about Mars. John may talk a little bit about Mars. Certainly John is going to talk also about Europa in terms of <coughs> things that could live in water uh, and in hydrothermal systems and so on. So we'll have some convergence there as well. But I'm actually um, going to say two things. One is that um, based on impact exchange, almost certainly we've already handled and sampled Martian life in some way. Or Martian life has handled us, is perhaps another way to put it. And then I'll talk about all the various problems associated with Europa, not merely whether there could be life there, but just the problems of going to explore it. From there, I'll move on to the Saturn system, Titan and Enceladus. Uh, and uh, I'm going to get uh, really partisan here and argue that the best place to go to look for life might actually be the Saturn system and not the Jupiter system, but I could be wrong. And then uh, I'll talk about extrasolar planets. Now here I really get into, uh, um, I should say, dangerous waters because uh, there are several people here who actually detect extrasolar planets. and so. For me to lecture to them uh, is, well, the British say carrying coals to Newcastle, but it's probably worse than that. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what's going to happen here. It might be a music video or something like that. But um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, then I'll talk. At least here I can talk about prospects uh, for detecting life on extraterrestrial planets because this is much less well constrained. And whereas the sky's the limit for uh, detecting extrasolar planets, it's really the budgets that, that's the limit for um, being able to detect uh, life or even this, uh, the possibility that something could be a habitable world. Uh, basically, this is going to determine whether any of this happens while some of the people in the back still look young or whether they actually have gray hair and are um, running conferences like this. So, that's the uh, that's the outline, that's the plan. So let me start with interstellar matter and chemistry. <clears throat> and uh, I noticed there are cosmologists here. I found out yesterday evening that there were cosmologists here. So 
I'm really only going to talk about cosmology, and I feel that this is okay because although I respect cosmologists extremely highly, I recognize that it's actually possible to say uh, outrageous things that are probably wrong, but they can't tell you that they're wrong, at least not yet. And they may never be able to tell you that they're wrong, so, uh, so it's okay. Um, so this is a very familiar uh, diagram now that came from uh, the WMAP team originally, I think it may have some precursors to it. It is a, uh, an attempt, and I think it's a quite nice attempt, to chart out in a way that's at least graphically understandable, even if it's not geometrically correct, uh, the history of the universe from the time of the Big Bang, uh, which is here labeled as quantum fluctuations, to uh, through inflation, and then on to the overall evolution of the cosmos. Now, the key issues with respect to the universe uh, as we know it are that it appears to have had a very definite beginning to it, which has been very nicely hammered down at something like 13.7 billion years ago by looking at variations in the cosmic microwave background radiation. Um, the key problem is what actually happens prior to uh, the time that the universe could actually be observed in this way with these background fluctuations because there had to have been an enormous change of scale that's called inflation uh, which some regard as, as uh, an essential part of a particular cosmological model and others regard as, as arbitrary. But whatever happened, this was essential to actually making a universe that could uh, produce elements and then molecules uh, and essentially have the macroscopic space and the physical laws necessary to do that. So um, whether this is all embedded within some larger dimensional brain, B-R-A-N-E, or something else is, is the realm of modern cosmology and is very interesting but is beyond me. But what's important is that the first stars appear a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And once they begin, uh, elements other than hydrogen and helium and a little bit of lithium uh, are generated within the interiors of these stars and also in the course of the end state of the more massive stars, the supernovas, as they explode. And that production of elements is crucial to the formation of planets and life. Now this process of course goes on starting with very metal poor stars that are essentially purely hydrogen and helium onto the so-called population two stars which are metal deficient uh, but which have some metals, that is, have some elements heavier than hydrogen and helium. And then within the last eight billion, uh, four to eight billion years, stars that have uh, a composition that is comparable to that of the sun. Now whether the earlier metal poor stars could have managed during their formation to eke out a few planets uh, and thereby produce life uh, early in the cosmos uh, is of course not clear. We don't know because we um, don't know uh, of any other life besides our own in the cosmos and finding um, planets around metal poor stars uh, is a very very important uh, aspect of the search. Uh, if one were to find uh, a number of such stars that had planets that would be a significant development. Of course it would be very hard to see but not impossible. Uh, the last few billion years, last half I should say, of the history of the cosmos uh, has been characterized again by expansion but by an accelerated expansion which uh, is not well understood. Um, it is uh, characterized in terms of uh, dark energy which essentially uh, exerts a kind of a negative pressure uh, which, uh, depending on its particular strength and origin, uh, could actually uh, dominate everything after some uh, unknown number of, of lifetimes of the universe uh, and eventually tear everything up, which would be a definitive end to everything. But, um, of course, this is not well understood and a lot of modern cosmology is devoted to trying to understand it. Uh, I'm not going to focus on this, of course. What's important for the development of planets and life is what goes on in the main part of this expanding cone. And here, um, 
what is crucial is the ability uh, of the cosmos to manufacture uh, not only elements but also molecules and polymers. So since we're going to be talking a lot about life, let me try to simplify it to the same egregious extent that I just tried to simplify cosmology. Um, life as we know it essentially uses all the elements that are available on the earth. And since the earth is the only place where we know life exists, I can simply keep referring to the earth. Of course, the dominant elements that are present in life, and I realize now I actually have a pointer here, the dominant elements that are present in life uh, are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Uh, there are other elements that are crucially important as well. Uh, phosphorus uh, is important in the information carrying molecules and the energy bearing molecules, uh, as well as uh, metals and so on. Uh, whatever is in the environment, life uses in one form or another. Uh, there are some elements that are preferred. Uh, obviously, life uses carbon. It doesn't use silicon, which is one row down in the periodic table. Life uses phosphorus. It doesn't use arsenic, uh, in spite of the recent discovery that was announced by NASA. Um, arsenic being one row down from phosphorus in the periodic table. So there are some preferences according to the, the particular pro, uh, bonding properties and the number of completed electron shells and so on. There are also preferences associated with abundance. If you look at cosmic abundances, of course hydrogen and helium are the most abundant elements, but the next group of elements are those that are uh, produced in the, the, the standard uh, nucleosynthetic process of converting hydrogen to alpha particles and then building alpha particles into carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Uh, those are very abundant and those are uh, the key elements used in life. Uh, they're uh, the building blocks of uh, the simple molecules amino acids and the nucleotide bases. And these simple molecules which can be produced abiotically and are produced in space uh, then go on to uh, be built up into polymers, proteins, which are the structural scaffolding of life and also serve as, as uh, very elaborate catalysts. Uh, the, the enzymes uh, are crucial for life, but the proteins themselves cannot be constructed without the information that's contained in two molecules, DNA and RNA, which are built up from the sugar ribose and deoxyribose, uh, bound together with uh, phosphate bonds, high energy <coughs> bonds. Uh, and these serve as the structure to build ladders of nucleotide bases that are essentially letters in an alphabet that provide this the order and the particular identification of amino acids that have to be assembled together in a chain to make functional proteins. Now, <clears throat> because of that, uh, there's this interesting chicken and egg problem. Uh, the proteins are really needed to replicate DNA and to sustain this whole machinery of the exchange of information between DNA and RNA, the various types of RNA, and then the assembly of proteins with the instructions in RNA. But at the same time, uh, the proteins are constructed only with the instructions that are available in the DNA and the RNA. So where does this actually start? Where do you start this cycle? And uh, John is going to explain all about that later in the week. But what's important for us is um, that these are molecules, small molecules, and these are polymers. And the universe has to be uh, suitable for making molecules and polymers. And so it has to be cool enough to do that. And the universe is cool enough to do that because of its expansion. So the cycle of matter in the present epoch can be sketched out in this way. Uh, there is nucleosynthesis uh, of elements heavier than uh, hydrogen and also helium, which of course is also being made in stars. That's ongoing. Um, these are expelled, uh, of course, into the interstellar medium, find their way into molecular clouds. Molecules are formed within those molecular clouds. Uh, there are a wide variety of environments uh, within those clouds of differing temperature and composition. Uh, grain formation uh, is possible <coughs> in the interstellar medium in various environments, particularly in clouds. 
Grains are important for two reasons. Uh, one is that they provide the surfaces for uh, chemistry and potentially catalyt catalytic chemistry. Uh, they also provide the means for carrying uh, more volatile species uh, through adsorption or processes related to adsorption into the solid, what will become the solid bodies of planetary systems. Uh, and uh, so grain formation is, is a, a crucial aspect of this cycle. And then um, this is just a pretty chart of uh, CO emission in the Milky Way galaxy. Continuing onward from there, uh, chemistry occurs in a wide variety of environments in the interstellar medium. In the diffuse interstellar medium, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, small ring structures are produced among other uh, organic molecules. Uh, amino acids are produced uh, in some of these environments, cold dense clouds, their surface chemistry, warm clouds and hot cores can produce in addition to very simple molecules, slightly more complex ones like formaldehyde and methanol and so on, uh, which can be the starting point, albeit very early starting point for some of the prebiotic chemistry that eventually might lead to the formation of life and did in the case of the earth lead to the origin of life. The problem that we always have in this business is knowing how far that chemistry went in interstellar space uh, versus on the surface of a planetary body like the Earth uh, and where in that environment it actually occurred. Now a whole different phase of chemistry begins uh, in those parts of molecular clouds where disks can form. Disks of course are um, the accompaniment of star formation in the cases where there's some amount of angular momentum and during the collapse of a cloud core clump that angular momentum conserved leads to uh, a large spin and the formation of a disk. These disks are very important because they are uh, always dissipative. Uh, if they are not turbulent uh, they have um, torques that are mostly due to uh, self-gravity or there can be magnetic torques. And these processes, turbulence, ma magnetic or gravitational torques, will cause the disks to evolve and the net tendency is for most of the material in the disks to fall into the parent star. But what remains has been processed in an environment that has a variety of different temperatures, different amounts of grains of differing composition, uh, and the ability to, in the case of the turbulent disks, actually cycle material from the disk midplane up to uh, colder regions which are exposed to ultraviolet light and then back down to the midplane where they're protected from ultraviolet light so that the potential for a lot of chemistry particularly with the organic molecules uh, is certainly present within these disks and then of course ultimately um, planets form from these disks and we'll talk about that later this afternoon. So chemistry during infall, exposure to shocks, thermal chemistry in the disk, chemistry even in concentrated regions, higher pressure regions around giant planets as they form, produces completely different uh, molecular abundances, more CH4 and less carbon monoxide, for example. And then uh, planets have atmospheres. In fact, planets probably have several stages of atmospheres. Uh, <laughs> in which uh, planetary chemistry occurs, chemistry that is driven both by thermal processes uh, just due to the background temperatures and also due to the entry of um, hypersonic bolides, fragments of, of material left over from the formation of the solar system, and also chemistry associated with irradiation from the early sun, uh, both uh, photon radiation and also uh, particle radiation. And then uh, in these planetary atmospheres and on the surfaces where chemistry occurs, at least in one place, life began, it developed, built mountain resorts, had conferences about how it came to be, and eventually it's all over with. Uh, the parent star, in this case the sun, becomes a red giant, uh, expels the atmospheres from those planets that are in the habitable zone, and that's really the end of everything. But it may actually be the case, uh, as I think maybe Jim is going to talk about, that life might have an ending earlier than that. Are you going to talk about that, or am I supposed well, to talk about that? Uh, 
we'll, we'll, we'll negotiate. We'll figure that out over one. Right. Okay. But, um, you know, this is the ultimate end, but there may be an earlier end. Yeah, that's right. Now, in the case of um, more massive stars, of course, that expulsion of material uh, is uh, expelling a large fraction of the mass of the star itself, and that kind of closes the cycle of matter in the galaxy, if you want to think of it as a cycle. And we have plenty of evidence for all of this. Um, this these are data from ISO, quite old now, but it's a very nice uh, chart that shows uh, as a function, this is flux on the y-axis, wavelength in microns on the x-axis in the infrared from 5 microns out to 40 microns. This is going to be the sweet spot uh, for the MIRI instrument, the mid-infrared spectrometer and imager on James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which uh, once it is launched uh, will really be able to do a fantastic job on all these objects. Uh, but ISO did a terrific job as well. So here's an embedded, in an embedded young stellar object, we see the 10 micron silicate feature, water, uh, methanol, uh, methane carbon dioxide, already quite an impressive uh, chemistry. Uh, one also sees here uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in a YSO that is coming out of its uh, gaseous and dusty cocoon. Uh, here is um, a, uh, a spectrum uh, of a young disk. You don't see very much here, but you do see the silicate emission feature and then polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And then a number of interesting, uh, presumably organic features in mature disks and also in comets. Um, we will know a lot more about comets in the next five years when Rosetta actually rendezvous with a comet, but already, as I'll talk about later in the week, we know a, a tremendous amount about the organic chemistry uh, that is contained uh, within comets and which may in fact have supplied the Earth with organic material. So, uh, of course, radio astronomers are also able to uh, uh, measure uh, organic molecules and identify them through some uh, very, very uh, high precision laboratory work. Uh, this is a small subset of uh, the organic molecules that have been found in interstellar space, uh, which include uh, sugars, for example, uh, amino acids are also produced. These are carboxylic acids related to amino acids. I'm not sure how well this actually comes out, but this is a comparison of fractional abundances. This is uh, 10 to the minus 4, so this is 100 parts per million, a part per million, a part per billion. Uh, in the diffuse interstellar medium, cold dark clouds, uh, around a low mass protostar and then around a very high mass protostar in the Orion hot core. <clears throat> um, the basic idea here is just to show that, of course, molecules, atoms occur in these environments, uh, the diffuse environments. Uh, progressively, one sees uh, <clears throat> a disappearance of the atoms and production of ever more complex uh, molecules. And one can imagine that the most interesting molecules, the ones that you simply can't see by astronomical techniques, are also present in uh, these uh, later developments running from the dark clouds on eventually to protoplanetary disks. And so one of the outstanding questions that really needs to be answered if we want to understand uh, how often and in what variety of places the opportunity is available for life to arise is that one needs to be able to probe these environments as deeply as possible to see as complex a set of molecules as possible, even to the point of trying to detect, let's say, RNA in, uh, in an astrophysical environment. And of course, the coming uh, new facilities uh, in the next 15 or 20 years, some coming online now, some that will be coming online, SOFIA, ALMA, James Webb Space Telescope, large ground-based optical telescopes, uh, radio, additional radio telescopes, uh, submillimeter telescopes in the Atacama Desert, for example, um, will all push this search to a much, much uh, more sensitive and interesting realm, as interesting as it is now. <clears throat> so this is a, just a conceptual chart of the kinds of chemistry that can go on in dense clouds, and this includes uh, within the dense clouds uh, collapsing clumps and possibly disks that are embedded within them. 
And basically, this is um, just a kind of a laundry list of, of the different kinds of chemistry that one can imagine for small molecules. And so it's not you know, particularly um, uh, insightful in any way, except for the fact that the, the fact that one can imagine that all this type of chemistry is going on uh, says something about the complexity of these environments. So a lot of the precursor work, the chemistry needed to, to produce at least the building block molecules for life, uh, the ones in that middle column of the very simplified chart of life as we know it, uh, is almost certainly going on in interstellar space. Uh, and then finally, in disks themselves, this is um, a, a depiction by Bill Irvine of um, a disk embedded within a collapsing clump. Uh, here is the central protostar. There is a hole in the middle here, um, which uh, is uh, created by the star itself, by the stellar winds. Uh, the star has bipolar outflow that you see as well. Uh, there is an accretion shock at the surface of the disk here where uh, grains and gas coming into the disk are slowed and uh, chemistry occurs along that accretion shock. Grain evaporation also occurs here as well. So even though icy grains, uh, water ice for example, um, carbon dioxide ice, are produced uh, in the molecular cloud cores themselves, much of this material uh, is probably resublimated at least out to about five or ten astronomical units and then has to be reformed again within the disk itself. So the molecular products of that disk chemistry um, which involve grains uh, certainly survives at least in the the portion of the disk outward of five astronomical units but the solid phase carriers uh, may be disaggregated and uh, will have to reform in the disk itself. Uh, and then there's ultraviolet radiation and optical radiation from the, the sun itself. We <coughs> consider this to be the sun because disks tend to flare the outer surfaces of these disks corresponding to where the, uh, the uh, giant planets, the Kuiper belt uh, would be today, uh, actually have uh, sun shining on them, ultraviolet light on them and, and therefore uh, chemistry occurs. Uh, and of course, uh, as this material that is uh, collapsing onto the disk begins to dissipate uh, and is eroded away, uh, ultraviolet light from surrounding stars also uh, will energize chemistry uh, in the outer parts of the disk. In the inner parts of the disk, uh, along the mid-plane, the chemistry is predominantly thermal chemistry uh, and um, as I'll talk about when we discuss the origin of water on the Earth, uh, there can be a lot of very subtle effects associated with uh, the ice line, the sublimation of water uh, at the 3 to 5 AU region, and a sulfur line inward of that, which can alter the chemistry of these disks, uh, at least for our solar system, in a way that's potentially detectable. Uh, and uh, we have solid samples of the earliest history of the solar system in the form of carbonaceous chondrites uh, of various types. Uh, they have a wealth of uh, amino, uh, of organic molecules within them, uh, including amino acids, most of which are not the amino acids that are useful for uh, life as we know it here on the Earth. Uh, life uses 20, 22 amino acids. Um, almost entirely of the same chirality or handedness where that's relevant. Uh, nature in the absence of life produces a much wider variety of these compounds. All right, so how does all this occur? Why does all this occur? Does it really matter? In some sense it doesn't really matter because it's, it's happened, right? But I think it's interesting to reflect a little bit on what it is that actually sustains the generation of complexity and where this is kind of built into the laws of the cosmos. And so in the last 10 minutes, I want to get a little bit philosophical and uh, discuss that. So we want to ask, how do we get from uh, this business here, where there is, is some structure, in fact, uh, all the way out to the development of molecules, minerals, polymers, and life? Well, um, it was Sir Arthur Eddington who said that it was OK it was okay if your model violated Maxwell's laws. There might be something wrong with Maxwell's equations. 
And it's also okay if your ideas violated experimental evidence because experimenters sometimes get things wrong. But he said, if your theory violates the second law of thermodynamics, there's absolutely no hope for you. Yeah, all hope is lost. So the three laws of thermodynamics are that energy can be uh, transformed from one form to another, but is overall conserved. <coughs> Any process in the cosmos increases the overall entropy as long as you consider a large enough system. And then the entropy can get arbitrarily small if you go to arbitrarily low temperatures, which is a good thing. So what that means, and this is now a chart from Charlie Lineweaver, which is kind of nice, <coughs> is that really nothing could have happened in the universe until temperatures got low. Temperatures had to get low because if you want a process to generate complexity, you have to accept the fact that you're going to have to generate a lot of entropy. And in order to generate a lot of entropy, you have to start out with something, first of all, that has low entropy, uh, and secondly, is in an environment where you can do some process, do some sort of work on it, uh, that then allows you to generate a lot of entropy, but within this, a subset of that system, uh, the entropy locally has decreased, or you've generated some kind of structure complexity. And um, another way to look at that is in terms of thermodynamic free energy, not necessarily the total energy, but the energy available to do some kind of work. And the point of this chart is to show that really, until one got to the point at which stars could actually form, which is here at about, uh, let's say, a few hundred million years after the, the, the origin of the cosmos, the time after the Big Bang. I should point out this is time and years logarithmically, so here, here we are today. And this is temperature of the universe in degrees Kelvin, also logarithmic. Uh, this is the uh, decline of the cosmic microwave background temperature. Uh, and um, then uh, this is um, the, effectively the temperature of hydrogen and stars, uh, which uh, one can consider uh, to, to be lower uh, than the cosmic microwave background radiation, potentially. Uh, and what's important here is that you eventually get to a point where first atoms can form, and then molecules can form, and then Right around, this is just purely associated with temperature. Once you get below 1,000 Kelvin, molecules are stable. And arguably, once you get to this point here, it's possible for stars to actually form. That is, you can have a self-gravitating ball of hydrogen that undergoes fusion, that has a strong temperature gradient now, both between the stellar surface and its interior. Here's the stellar core and the stellar surface and then the stellar surface and the background. Of course, here matter and radiation have decoupled from each other, and so they have different temperatures. And it's this critical difference, he argues, that allows uh, essentially for the stars to shine and radiate away that energy. And so that's actually not a very long period of time. That's only 400 million years after the Big Bang, so it's 13.3 billion years ago, and that allows a lot of time for other things to happen, which is certainly true. Um, what took a longer period of time, of course, was the development of heavy elements, uh, and therefore the, the beginning of third generation stars like the Sun, which only began to uh, shine about four, five, six billion years ago, depending on the, on the object. So the presence of, of self-gravitating shining objects in a background dark cosmos is actually crucial to the way that planets get large amounts of free energy, of available energy for work. And we can see that on a chart like this, which was designed for a different purpose by um, Ken Jux and, um, and colleagues uh, at, uh, at Harvard. And it's very simply a plot of the, the equivalent black body spectrum of the sun given in absolute intensity units as if you were standing 10 parsecs away and looking at it, but that's not relevant to us. So let's just ignore this y-axis here. And then this is wavelength in microns, and that is important. So this is the equivalent black body for the sun's photospheric effective temperature of something like 5,700 Kelvin. 
Now what's shown here are black bodies for uh, four planets and the zodiacal dust, Jupiter, Venus, Earth, Mars, and the zodiacal dust. We can really focus just on the Earth. We don't need to focus on the others. Um, what they did was not only to show the equivalent black body, but also to show a spectrum of the Earth, just to illustrate that, in fact, the Earth is not a terribly good black body, but you can still, even in this spectrum, see the outlines of two black bodies. One is the reflected light from the sun, which mimics the shape of the sun, but is down by 10 orders of magnitude. And the other is the thermal emission that peaks at about 10 microns, which is the result of the destruction of solar photons in the lower atmosphere and on the surface, the generation of uh, photons in the thermal infrared and their re-emission. Now, why does that process happen? Um, it sounds like a dumb question. Well, it wouldn't happen if the universe were at the, the photospheric temperature of the sun, right? There'd be plenty of radiation available. There'd be plenty of energy available, but you couldn't use any of it. So the fact that the sun and the earth are separated by uh, 150 million kilometers means that the energy, that the photons that come off the photosphere of the sun, which at, at the surface of the sun are in local thermodynamic equilibrium, with the gas are now streaming through free space and expanding in a series of shells. Paper, but no, that's okay. Actually, I'll make shells like this. That's okay. I'll make shells like this. Um, they're expanding through space, not interacting with anything, in fact. Um, my hands are really good shells. You can quote me on that. Okay. Um, and of course, as this radiation expands, it becomes more dilute. And as soon as it becomes more dilute, just incrementally far from the surface of the photosphere, it's out of thermodynamic equilibrium with the photosphere. It has the same spectral energy distribution as the photosphere of the sun, but it's now being diluted progressively. And this is not the right number of orders of magnitude because this is an observer's chart that also takes into account the smaller cross-sectional area of what you have to see to observe these bodies. But the point is the same, that these are many orders of magnitude down. What the Earth reflects is a, um, an imprint of that black body spectrum with some variations, but diluted so much that it is way out of thermal equilibrium with the photosphere. And so once that interacts with matter, it can do work because it's out of equilibrium. Now this is the reflected sunlight, but luckily the Earth reflects about 50%. Actually, maybe it's more like, that depends on whether it's cloudy or, or not, about 50% of the light from the sun. So this also represents uh, the amount that streams down to the surface of the Earth. And once it streams down to the surface of the Earth and interacts with matter, those photons are destroyed and there is a process that occurs. And that process, because that material has a very, very low entropy, it's come off of the photosphere of the sun and is out of thermal thermodynamic equilibrium with the matter that it's interacting with, can do work and it also um, has to increase the overall entropy of the system when it does that work. And the easiest way to do that is for one of these high energy photons to suddenly become, and I'm sorry you can't see the little red news here, suddenly become a bunch of uh, much lower frequency photons, uh, more numerous, so that the entropy, which is the log of the number of states, increases uh, as the frequency declines because the number of photons goes way up. So this is thermalization. This is the fundamental starting point for uh, the greenhouse effect, for the heating of any planetary surface. Um, and so here it is illustrated graphically. But life on Earth actually does a little bit more. Life actually takes some of that incoming solar energy, uh, which again uh, has a very low entropy compared to the thermal energy background that those, those plants and cyanobacteria find themselves in. And it uses that very high quality energy then to do work in the form of photosynthesis, that is charging uh, electrons, putting electrons in higher energy states and using that to generate carbohydrates and so on. It's not a large fraction of the sunlight. This is exaggerated here. 
but the fact that this is sunlight that is streamed through free space and is out of equilibrium with the background on the Earth is essential to what those plants are then able to do. And um, so actually, I don't know who wrote this song because I know Les, Les Miserables went through several versions from Victor Hugo to the French stage play to the English stage play. But actually, uh, this is about right. Um, uh, the fact that stars are able to fill the darkness, but not too much, so that it's still dark, um, with photons that are generated initially in the interior at very low entropy, but then by the time they get to the photosphere, the entropy, of course, is increased. But it's still quite low compared to what's generated at the surface of a planet. The fact that that occurs means that there's plenty of, of usable free energy for life. And so the whole structure of the universe that is defined by the, the initial inflation and the acceleration of the cosmos, leaving aside the details of the physical laws and the, cos the constants uh, which everybody focuses on, that, that this really is, is the essential reason why we can have life <coughs> in this view. So anyway, these are little baby charts by Lineweaver showing that even as the environment greatly increases its entropy with time, life is able to uh, take this highly usable free energy and uh, increase its complexity with time, more efficient enzymes, new metabolic paths, more efficient photosynthesis, uh, better use of respiration, ad nauseum, whatever you want to say, because of that capability. Now you might ask, well gee, couldn't this be done at hydrothermal vents, which is not directly a result of solar radiation or solar nucleos nucleosynthesis? Well, indirectly it is a result of nucleosynthesis because what powers hydrothermal vents are the radioactive elements produced in prior generations of stars. So getting entirely away from stellar nucleosynthesis and trying to find an energy source for life is actually kind of difficult. Now having been very positive, let me close by being a little bit negative. There's a very interesting paper by McCabe and Lucas, which I think is in astrobiology. And it actually um, recapitulates an argument. By the way, the argument I just made has been made by a number of other people, Roger Penrose among others, but um, it's also in my astrobiology textbook uh, from 2005. Um, and uh, it's very useful in discussing the greenhouse effect. This argument by McCabe and Lucas kind of recapitulates one that was made by Paul Davies, pointing out that if you make a list of all the critical events that <clears throat> have had to occur for life on Earth to begin, it's taken a long time. Okay, first of all, here we are 13.7 billion years into the history of the cosmos and we actually don't know how long it's going to take for dark energy to really mess things up. Might be a long, long time, but we don't know that yet. Okay, but more importantly, from the formation of the sun to the generation of the first complex cells, the first eukaryotes, um, has taken um, about one-fifth of the main sequence lifetime of the sun. And if you follow some of the arguments that Jim Casting and his colleagues have made about the fact that the earth may become uninhabitable long before the sun exits the main sequence, possibly within the next billion years, then we're talking about only about one third or maybe less. Uh, uh, sorry, I should go the other round. This is, this is one third of the total habitable lifetime of the sun's main sequence. That is, if six or seven billion years is the main sequence lifetime of the sun during which the earth both has been habitable and can be habitable, which is somewhat generous, this already is a third of that time just to get to the eukaryotes. And then um, quite a lot more time to get to higher organisms. The point of all this is if you take a series of events like this, uh, that have certain probabilities to occur based on other events. And you look at their um, uh, composite probability, the, the coupled overall probability. If the time it takes for these events to occur is a significant fraction of the time that's available for these events to occur, then you have to conclude that the, the probability that this is going to happen again and again and again is really quite small. 
So um, from the mathematical point of view, there's not a lot that's wrong with this argument. There may be something that's biologically wrong with this argument, but it should give one a little bit of pause. So that's it for my talk. Um, I will close with a few propositions. Uh, one is that the really important thing that made life possible in the cosmos is the fact that the universe expands and that most of space is empty and that gravity, gravity contributes to making relatively low entropy radiation. And so that low entropy radiation is the key local feature that makes life on Earth possible. Uh, it took a very long time for the party to get going on the Earth. Of course, life probably began very early in the history of the Earth, but prokaryotes are sort of interesting. I count the interesting part as when sexual reproduction actually began. That's when the party got going. And that's, you know, halfway through the history of the Earth. So we may actually be quite alone. And how long this party will actually go on uh, is a, definitely a philosophical question. It's not clear we'll be able to answer this even from W first. But it, it probably depends on what dark energy is and what its nature and strength is. So is it something that's going to wreck the party? Or uh, is it going to uh, uh, stay low enough that it's going to allow things to keep going for a long time? Or if you're Roger Penrose, is dark energy something that's going to actually trigger through the disruption of, of, uh, of the fabric of present space a new Big Bang that will allow everything to start all over again? So with those crazy thoughts, I'll stop and be happy to take a question or two. Thank you. Jim. Yeah, Jonathan, I, I think it's very interesting that you ended the way you did, talking about the pessimistic view on whether li complex life will emerge. Mm -hmm. Peter Ward and Don Brownlee have also done this in their book, Rare Earth. Right, from a different perspective. And one of the interesting things that I you know, hope to, will come out of this discussion is, you know, life could be rare if it's, if it, you know, as you say, if it, if it evolves very slowly compared to planetary evolution time yep. scales. But what if it's the planetary evolution that is actually controlling the time scale for biological evolution? Yes, in that case, these are not a series of improbable events. They're a series of highly probable events that just have to be triggered at a certain point, by, but will be triggered at that so point. So then, then you might end up with a more optimistic viewpoint. If the evolution of the Earth is typical. Right. Yeah. Okay, now rule number seven is I talk longer and longer if no one asks questions in the first lecture. So at least somebody's got to come up with an objection to the first half of my lecture on interstellar chemistry. Because there were at least five errors in it. Yes, Alain. The main objection to the physical view is the number of three ten to the star in the galaxy. Uh, it's a huge number. It is. Uh, so yep. then if it happened only in one percent, yep. point one percent of the case, it's still a huge number. If it happens one percent of the time, it's a huge number. If it turns out that the probability of of eukaryotic life is a part in ten to the twelve, <coughs> we're in trouble. Yes. We don't know. We don't know what that number is. It could be ten to the minus two. It could be ten to the minus twelve. This this is the dilemma. This is the dilemma. Until we get some understanding on the planetary level of how all this happened, I don't know how to assign an exponent to it. And another point is the interesting increasing of even exponentially increasing of the complexity. Mm. If you look at the evolution of the last, of the last 10 million years, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, it's really impressive. It it's is. kind of explosion. It is, yeah, it, it, it really is. And, um, yeah, and it, you know, it, where is it all going to end? It's very interesting. Uh, how far can it go on the Earth? And this has nothing with uh, the planetary uh, phenomena, or very little. Right. It's not an extension of the It is a self-producing uh, phenomenon. Yeah, I haven't seen any arguments in the literature as to limitations of biological complexity. I'm sure there must be some attempts at that, but. Uh, I mean, clearly there are arguments about, you know, the, the size of the genome that a eukaryotic cell can actually carry and maintain and, and replicate and, and all these other things. But presumably one could make arguments about, you know, the ultimate limit of biological complexity based on that. But I, I wouldn't make them myself. I wouldn't try to make them. 
Yes, one more. Uh, concerning the argument uh, about the entropy of the sun, it's clear that the, uh, a star like the sun has a much lower entropy than the interstellar medium, but a white dwarf for a neutron star would have even a lower entropy, much lower. And so that uh, it's not a favorable case to apparently to, to life. So the, the entropy is not the only argument. Yeah, I guess a white dwarf is not a favorable case for life, but I'm not sure that's true. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Um, it's certainly the case that for whatever reason, at least two neutron stars have planets around them. Uh, we assume those are, are not only uninhabitable, but completely uninhabitable, but maybe that's wrong. You know, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't look like a good place for organic molecules but maybe that's not the only kind of self-organizing chemistry one can have. So for life as we know it on Earth, your statement is correct, but for life as, uh, as a phenomenon of high chemical complexity, I don't know if a neutron star is a bad place. Uh, just I want to say is that if the entropy is the only argument... If it were, yes. Uh, the most favorable case would be a white dwarf and neutron stars. Yes, that's right, but my response is that um, that doesn't necessarily contradict the statement if you allow for the notion that chemical complexity can go beyond organic molecules, which obviously wouldn't exist on the surface of a planet orbiting a neutron star. Let's say they might exist around a white dwarf. I don't see anything wrong with having a planet around a white dwarf and using that, uh, that energy. Um, that could be organic. Um, we just don't know. <laughs> we don't know what exists around these other post-main sequence stars. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>